and welcome to Tech Talks, the People and Planet podcast. Today, I'm joined by Zoe Blake, the CEO of Careloop Health. Hi, Zoe. How's it going? Hi, Lee. I'm good. Thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is going to be interesting because it's a very, very, very important mission, um, and you're going to expand on that um, in a lot more on the on the chat. But this is all about tackling severe mental health, isn't it? Yeah, um, no, mental illness. In fact, we use the terminology. Okay, mental illness. Um, yeah. So let's, let's give us an expansion on that then. What, what's yep. the what? What is the problem that you're solving with the company mission? How did you arrive at that? What's what's inspired it? OK, so the reason I made the distinction between severe mental illness and mental health is really just to help uh, sort of clarify where we are on the spectrum. So there's been an awful lot of uh, innovation in common mental health issues such as anxiety and depression, and, and that can be from mild to moderate to even severe. But at the other end of the spectrum, you've got severe mental illness and common diagnoses within that would be schizophrenia and psychosis and bipolar uh, and also actually major depression disorder as well. So severe mental illness by default is, is a chronic illness. Uh, it's a lifelong condition. Um, the impact on the individual is, is severe. So just in terms of some sort of figures, around 1% of the population will suffer from psychosis. Of that population, 93% will be unemployed, will find it very difficult to be in employment. 80% um, of those people who experience a first episode of psychosis will relapse. And typically across someone's lifespan, they will have um, multiple relapses. And in fact, your chance is one in four every year. And, and the reason that I'm, I'm so interested in it is I come from I'm sure we'll talk about it a bit later, but I come from an experience of working in digital mental health um, and we've got a lot of technology and a lot of innovation in that area of mental illness and mental health, sorry, but within mental illness we have nothing. And in fact there's been no innovation within this area in medication even since the 1970s and there's very, very little in the area of digital mental health. So even at, even at the one percent, you're still talking huge numbers, aren't you, given yeah. 60 odd million people in the country? So 1% is for psychosis and schizophrenia. If you if you group it together with bipolar, you're looking at about 5%. But I'll talk specifically about schizophrenia and psychosis because that's the product that we have ready in market now. So the, the numbers prevalence is about half a million. Uh, at any one time, there are 220,000 people being treated for schizophrenia in the NHS. And I think the key thing to understand is that this is a, a group of pe people who need a disproportionate amount of care. So it, it can constitutes 30 percent of all of the mental health budget in the NHS goes to schizophrenia. Um, the, about 75 percent of all mental health beds are being taken by somebody who's experiencing relapse or, or, or an, an unscheduled um, event because of relapse in schizophrenia. Um, and in terms of the cost, well, it's around four billion pounds a year to care for schizophrenia, which is, as I think I said, 30 percent of the mental health budget, but also four percent of the NHS's budget. And for comparison, it's just under four percent, to be fair. But for comparison, cancer care in total is five point six percent. So it costs an awful lot of money to treat relapse, even if it's in hospital or if it's a home with high intensity care. Understood. OK, got it. So so it's a huge, huge problem. It's costly, um, you know, and what's the solution? So our solution. Um, so we're, we're very much and, and I'd say that we are unique. I challenge anyone who's listening or watching to, to find a competitor because um, I've looked in the market. Um, we are looking at predicting um, relapse before it happens. And so we're, we're based on the, um, the principles of 4P medicine. And, and that's not just about severe mental illness. That's generally a principle. And that is about being preventative, being predictive, um, to be personalised and also participatory. And so what that means for us is that we have built a tool, a digital tool that looks at someone's symptom profile. So looks at what someone's unique personal experience of psychosis and schizophrenia is. And we look at signs of escalation. And so we collect data using a smartphone for symptoms. We then train our algorithm, which is proprietary, on that person's what's called um, a prodromal footprint. So you will experience a prodromal phase, which I know I'm getting very um, clinical here and I'm not a clinician. But fundamentally, what happens is before someone goes into a relapse, there's a period of between three and 10 days only where they will exhibit signs of escalation that are unique to them. But I repeat it each time. 
and that's a prodromal footprint and we are looking at that for that in data so we train our algorithm to look for that as an individual footprint and when we see it we can raise a very early alert and that allows um, either a peer so we have actually peer models in this country to support each other or a care, a care coordinator to do a very light touch intervention of what's going on and if you get there at that early phase you don't escalate to the relapse and what we found if you use our tool there were 50 percent fewer relapses in the group that used our tool against the group just using standard care and the, th the first thing that's come into my mind there is how do you get people to participate in it? And you mentioned that as one of the four P's there. Um, do, do you have a, a, I'm assuming it's a high participation rate if you've managed to decrease it by 50%. So when you say participation, there's two things I'm taking from that. I'm taking how do you get people into people's hands, but I'm also getting adherence and how if they can keep yeah. using it. So the, the thing about our, our tool is it, it's not a standalone get from the app store. It's very much part of a, an integrated care pathway. So we're working with mental health trusts as this is a tool that you would be offered. So ideally, you know, if you go in and you're with your clinician, they're talking to you about the number of things that you could be offered, which will include um, CBT based therapy. It will be, include family based intervention therapy of which there are very long wait lists in this country. You, know, you can actually wait up to two years for those. Um, you'll be offered medication, but alongside that, we'd like them to be offered a digital tool. Yeah. Uh, so that's how we would sort of actually participate. Now, it's not for everybody. Very much, um, we, we recognise it's choice. And some people, um, technology does actually exacerbate their, their psychosis. And so that's not going to be right for them. Um, what we found, though, is that those people who use it have felt that it's, very, it's safe and it hasn't caused them additional distress. And if it has at mild levels, stopping it and it goes away. So there's no long term side effects, if you like, from using at all. The other part of participation is adherence. So of those people who use the tool, it's actually um, you get a daily reminder to fill in a questionnaire. We don't need you to answer it every day, but but a, a, at least three to four days a week. And it is called adherent. Uh, is we would count that as adhering to the process. And what we found in all our tests is our lowest adherence level over 12 months was 75 percent. And that's very high for a digital tool. Sure. And I can compare that, if you like, to antipsychotics, where adherence is about 42%. Wow. That's really interesting. And I, you know what? I didn't, I didn't expect you were going to say 75% there. That, that would be the one thing that I was thinking, wow, are these people actually going to you know, adhere to it? Um, sounds really great. So, so the actual product itself then um, is, a, is a series of questionnaires. Is that how it works? So, um, so it, we'll, we'll call it a platform. It actually is a digital therapeutic in its purest form. So I, I don't know, the language is quite often used. I, I mean, I find it very helpful that you've got digital technology, digital health technology, and then you have digital therapeutics, which are a subset. The requirement to be called a digital therapeutic is you have an evidence base for your technology and, and not using a technology that uses something with an evidence base. And so it's taken us over 10 years to build our evidence base. We have five randomized control trials. Um, and so we've we demonstrated that uh, efficacy of our technology. So I, I can say that we are a, a digital therapeutic. Um, what in terms of what does it look like? Well, there's an app on a smartphone, which you can download from the uh, Google Play or from the App Store. You can't do it yourself because um, you need a code to, from the, the side. We then secure um, what's in the app is the questionnaire is surfaced, but also, and that's proprietary. We based it on standardized questions, but we own the branching and how we've done that. We also have a lot of self-help materials um, so that people can actually use self-coping. So there's videos, there's audio, um, there's psychoeducational content in there as for self. Um, and also the other thing that happens is when you submit the data, we present it back. So a very big thing in all mental health is actually noting your own patterns and knowing that we're experiencing that moment may be a pattern or may not be what you've experienced before. So you can help um, self-manage. All the data is then all uh, transferred to uh, securely to our server. And then the other part of our platform is data visualization, which is for the clinicians. So we have all the data in absolute minutiae detail and different profiles for different workers so that they can look at the data and use that to discuss. So the participatory part of our of our product is, yes, you can see the content yourself and you can actually use self-management. But very often when you go into um, a clinical meeting, and this isn't just for, for people with severe mental illness, but you're asked, how have you been? And it can be very difficult to recall over the period of time since your last meeting what actually looks like. And in fact, we all kind of think how we've been in the last couple of days. So if it's been two weeks or even eight weeks, as it is in community-based mental health services, it's very difficult to recall that. 
Um, and so actually having data available is like, oh, actually, yeah, I've been like this. Or the clinician say, I can see how you've been and I can see how this was. So it's much easier to participate in your own care if there's a, a concrete uh, content to discuss. Um, and then the other part of that is within the dashboard, we have the alerts. So the algorithm's running and it alerts within the dashboard. And then we have protocols that we've set up with the trust as to, to highlight to the right person that this is time to, to make that call um, or, to, or even to in a, a routine meeting that you've got planned to ask what's going on. So how did you arrive at Kenneth then? What's, you know, you touched on it at the start of the chat. Um, you've got a, a long career history within the sector. Um, show a little bit more for the listeners. Yeah, sure. So um, it, it has been a journey and it didn't start. And as I said, I'm not a clinician. I'm very much come from the technology background um, and I've been in a long time. So my career has followed what I think the trajectory of technology generally has followed. So I started in telecoms. Um, and then from telecoms went into um, uh, consumer facing uh, websites sort of dot com boom that I went through and then into infrastructure and software until I then landed in data and data is really where I see you know technology has come from all the things that I did earlier are very much utilities now uh, and now we're looking at how we use data. So I was sat in the um, a large software company on their board. I scaled a business that used data to uh, deliver adverts. In a, we used very much big data there, the five Vs of big data. And then I landed in, in digital mental health. And so my role previous to this was in Cooth, which is a, a platform for young people. And when I was there, um, an advisor to on our board who I appointed was Dr. Uh, sorry, Professor Sean Lewis. And he's a psychiatrist uh, and also um, leading in the light, in field of research for severe mental illness. So when I'd left Cooth, he said, could you come and help found Care Loop Health, along with three other directors from the University of Manchester, because we're a spin out of the University of Manchester. Fantastic. So you, you're in good company there then. Um, in terms of uh, you mentioned it, it, Kelly, 10 years old, is it? You had to prove your FC? So the, so the business is not. The business is new. We are a startup. We yeah. are officially, I think, two years now, uh, maybe two and a half. Um, but the research that we're based on oh, comes yeah. out of the university, and that is over 10 years and, and ongoing, actually, because we're currently, or well, the university is running um, a very in depth and very large scale study looking at passive data. So, where we use active data, which is answering questions, we're now looking at whether we can either augment or replace that data with passive data from wearables there's all sorts of interesting things around tone of voice within mental illness and mental health and whether we can use sensors on the phone as i say to augment or to replace the uh, active data that we currently use for algorithm interesting and i believe the university of manchester is one of the leading places for um, mental illness research yeah so uh, absolutely um so i'm we're very i'm very fortunate my directors co-directors are the professor of adult psychiatry at the University of Manchester, the professor of clinical psychology, the professor of health informatics, and also a, a doctor within the health <laughs> informatics as well with extreme experience, lots of experience of implementing mental health tools into the NHS. So yeah, I, I'm a, amongst very good company and they are world renowned. So the research um, that we're cu they're currently doing on um, the passive data, as I said, is funded by the Wellcome Trust. Uh, and I know that they are um, they're one of two organisations across the globe um, that are doing that kind of work. Nice, nice. Um, so, so two years old then, really, um, as in terms of the business itself. I'm always interested with, with startups to, to understand how you've navigated any challenges within that time. Anything that you can expand on there? Well, I can't talk in the past. Navigated, navigating, and and yet to navigate more <laughs> challenges is probably more more likely. Um, yeah, I think the first thing we're very much we're we're working at the high end, high acuity end of the spectrum. So you know, one of the key things that we have to be is credible. This is not an area. So as I said, I come from the technology fields and. It's very common there to spin up a, a, an MVP and have a go and test it in market. We cannot operate like that. This is, you know, this is this is a clinical product, uh, and so it, it is a very different mindset. So in the last sort of year, a lot of what we were doing is um, adding to that credibility through um, all the. Uh, so we, we got our ISO, we're a class one medical device registered. Um, we've done, when you sell to the NHS, there are a lot of requirements around governance and compliance. So we've done those around something called DTAC, which is, is, is a cumbersome and long-winded, long process, but is very necessary to demonstrate um, the, the, the rigour of, of what you're doing. Um, and so then really the big 
sort of um, watershed moment for us, if you like, was happened in March when we, it was announced that NICE, the um, National Institute for Health and Care uh, Excellence, have approved our product or given guidance that our product can now be used in the NHS um, whilst we gather real world evidence for the next three years with the aim that if we gather that at the level we need, it will become standard care for psychosis. And, and that's what we've been working on an awful lot. So we're a very, very lean team. Um, we've been running off our own money. So we've been bootstrapped until this point. Um, and it's been very much about making sure that there are no hurdles, regulatory or, or quality hurdles for us to go into market and talk to people who really require us to be highly credible. You must have been you must have been delighted with the nice endorsement. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it really, really helps us. Um, it's a kite mark, not just in the UK, but it's a global kite mark. I know somebody told me that their visitors to the the nice website, 40 percent of them come from the States. So I know that it, it's a quality mark across the world. Um, and you know, it, again, it, it's it's a nerve wracking thing because you have to give over your evidence and say we believe. And they have a third party that then looks at all that evidence. They have um, a public committee that sits, including um, service users, people with lived experience who say, is this something that we think is valuable? Do, is the evidence credible and how you go through all of that rigor so not until the, the last moment when they, they publish the guidance so are you comfortable that actually this is the right thing and it, it is just another step along the way but it's a really important one because it's it's the rigor that we went through for that and it must be really nice because as a founder of the business you, you obviously believe in it you know you, from the very uh, you know first minute that you started you think, right, this is the way that we're actually going to change and solve this problem. And to have that backup must be, um, yeah, must yeah. be brilliant. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, as a founder, and I'm sure everybody will tell you, you, you spend most of your time head banging, banging your head against anything there is, like, can I knock on that wall? Can I knock? You just constantly feel that you're, you're trying to chip away at something. And then when this happens, it's almost like that someone's gone ahead and, and, and created yeah. something for you to go through or step through. I mean, it doesn't mean it's not the job's not done. But it, it really, really helps because, again, it just it's OK for me. And, and equally, I have a lot of research behind me, but it's OK for me to say that this is a credible product. But to have somebody to have nice say that as well just shifts the needle completely. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that leads on to, to the next point. Then, you know, what what comes next? What, what do you use that? You use it presumably to to, to get trusts in the UK um, to use the product. Right. Is that? Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, we are a startup. We are um, at the point where we are needing to do so that I've, I've worked, obviously, in the previous role with the NHS. And the key part of us getting adoption is to demonstrate through case studies. So we need champions. We need pilots that say this is how we, we, we fine tune the deployment model. We create um, a repeatable or a lift and shift model that the trusts can, can repeat without actually having to change anything too much. So so the key thing is to work with very uh, the early innovators and to demonstrate the value that we, we've achieved in research, but in a real world setting um, and to take do that in a patient way, actually. Um, and there's a lot of people we need to talk to engage with during that process as a business. Um, the challenge is to do that and to stay going because the, you know the, the, the commercial side of things um, always is out of sync if you like with the speed of, um, of other things so we have to keep that balance and so one of the key things for that is to go into other markets as well so we know that we can go uh, into markets where regulation is, co is comparable to the UK because um, we've deliberately chosen to do all that compliance knowing that it's probably very very rigorous and if we go to other markets then it's going to be very similar so um, we've already started very early look at the US um, yeah. Australia would be another one that could potentially be of interest, not least because it's the same language, but also because one of our founders is an Australian national and an honorary professor uh, in a local university. So that's what the business needs. Um, but on the other side of that, my challenge is fundraising. So as I said, we have been bootstrapped to this point. Um, and so now it is time for us to talk to um, investors who share our vision and, and can help accelerate our uh, development now. And, then, and presumably that investment's going to be to go into the other markets? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, we need to carry on um, patiently in the UK doing what we're doing, not least because we want to achieve um, uh, scale here, but also because it's such a great demonstration site, um, all the sites, sorry, the demonstration country for other markets as well. Um, and then, yes, absolutely, to scale beyond the two people we currently have full time um, and then uh, and our fractional our consultants and everything so that we can go into other markets.
Sounds brilliant. And, and do you have any sort of timescales on that? Are you thinking this year? Yeah, we're definitely thinking this year. Uh, yeah, we're actively looking now. So, um, you know, we would need to do that within the next next six to nine months. Well, message to our US listeners, take notes. Um, you could be seeing Kelly very, very soon. So it's all we've got time for. Thanks for joining us. It's been brilliant. Um, guys, this is Zoe Blake from Kelly Pell. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Lee. Bye bye.